Hello, great children of God. Today we're going to look at some of the basic ideas in chapter 2, especially the path to the act of faith. Uh, let's think first of all of a beautiful picture from the Hubble telescope. Here we can see the Cat's Eye Nebula. There's only one little problem with it, and that is it really doesn't look like this. The reason it doesn't look like this is because it's really composed of waves that are invisible to the human eye. The telescope Hubble, the cameras and software are able to take invisible rays to give them color and to make the light visible to our limited eyesight. Isn't that great? Well, it has an application in theology because that is what the light of faith does for us. Our intellect, which is our power of understanding, receives light from God's grace and enables us to understand the truth revealed to us by God. Isn't that wonderful? It's even greater than the work of the Hubble telescope, isn't it? We're going to consider here now the act of faith. What is the path to the act of faith? It starts down here with a few ideas and we're going to move up the page until we finally see how we make the act of faith in God. So the first thing we've been thinking about this week are the motives of credibility. Motives of credibility simply means reasons why Christian faith should be, could be, accepted as true. Why God's revelation to us in Jesus Christ has a ring of truth about it. And one of the main things, of course, is the miracles. Uh, we have miracles of healing in our church. We have the apparitions of the Blessed Mother. We have Eucharistic miracles. And all of these things taken together uh, reinforce the fact it's God's way of showing us that his revelation to us in the church is true. We also have prophecies as a motive of credibility. Lots of prophecies in the Old Testament that were fulfilled in Jesus, and other prophecies that came true. A prophecy, of course, is someone speaking on behalf of God. And then we have the amazing life of the church, which is a motive of credibility in itself. The church um, is, has an amazing life. It uh, probably should have died off thousand, a couple, of, you know, thousand years ago when the church was very young. Because uh, here we have some uneducated men and women starting in Galilee and Jerusalem and the Holy Land, going through the whole world, spreading the good news of Jesus Christ, even though kings and emperors tried to stamp out the faith by persecuting and killing the Christians, sending them to the lions, and all sorts of terrible suffering. But the church flourished and grew. And the same thing is true throughout 2,000 years. The Catholic Church is now the oldest institution on the face of the earth in continuous existence. So that's a motive of credibility, the wondrous life of the church. The church is, after all, the church of saints great saints and holy people, and we're still giving birth, at, and saints are still arising within the church. And then finally, a motive of credibility, the wondrous way that humans are fulfilled by the gospel of Jesus. Um, the, the gospel satisfies our hunger for justice, our hunger for meaning in life. Uh, the gospel always brings to believers a peace that surpasses understanding, the peace that Jesus himself promised. So the wonderful way that the gospel satisfies human hearts is a, another means of motive of credibility. All of these motives of credibility appeal to our intellect, which is our ability to understand our reason, and they convince us that God's truth can be found in the Catholic Church, in Revelation of Christianity. But that's not enough, because the will has to choose. Uh, if the will does not choose, 
freely, then there's no act of faith. And that's what the act of faith is. It is a decision by the human will motivated by, motiva uh, by the motives of credibility and also by the motive of faith that God himself cannot lie. And all of this makes the will choose to make the act of faith. So the will makes the act of faith in God himself, in the truths that God has revealed, such as the incarnation of his divine son Jesus, the gift of the Holy Spirit, the most holy trinity, everlasting life, which God himself has promised us, uh, and all of the other marvelous truths, and also gives us the ability to um, put our faith in the supernatural truths, or excuse me, the natural truths that are already revealed. We already know them through uh, our reason that God is infinite, that he's beautiful, that he's all-powerful. Uh, these things are all known by us by natural reason, but God has also put them in revelation. So he's told us once again, uh, and this is also an object of faith. These three things are known as objects of faith. Our faith, we put our faith in God himself. We put our faith in the truths he has revealed. We put our faith in the natural truths that have been specially revealed by God. So there you have it, the path to the act of faith. The intellect is drawn to the truth because of the external signs, the miracles, the prophecies, etc. And then the will is moved freely, uh, recognizing that God cannot lie, God who is the author of this truth. And so the will makes a decision to believe in revelation and accept it as true, to believe in God himself as the revealer, and to believe in the truths that he has revealed. There, you have a great summary. and. Uh, I hope this helped to clarify quite a bit of chapter two in a summary.